It's a lovely day again. And the weather is great at this side of the world. How are you all doing today? My name is Mr. Teacher. Different, but not bad because most of us did get my name in the last class. So, I'd make it what everyone would be able to remember. Today we would take look in the digestion and absorption of carbohydrates in biochemistry. Carbohydrates is a big source of energy in the body. In fact, carbohydrates constitute about 50% of the typical Western diet. Carbohydrate is present mainly in food as monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides. The monosaccharides are glucose, galactose in milk lactose and fructose in fruit and honey. The major disaccharides in the diet are sucrose in sugarcane and honey is composed of glucose plus fructose. Lactose, main sugar in milk, is composed of galactose plus glucose. Maltose is composed of two glucose units. The digestible polysaccharides are starch, made up of amylose and amylopectin, dextrins, and glycogen. Dietary fiber is made of polysaccharides that are usually poorly digested by the enzymes in the small intestine. They have an extremely important physiological function in that they provide the bulk that facilitates intestinal motility and function. Many vegetables and fruits are rich in fibers, and their frequent ingestion greatly decreases intestinal transit time. Hope we are making sense in what I'm saying. Let's get into digestion of carbohydrates properly. To be absorbed, dietary carbohydrates must be broken down into monosaccharides. Digestion of carbohydrates takes place in the following parts as follows. Mouth, the digestion of carbohydrates starts when food is mixed with saliva during chewing by the enzyme tialin, salivary alpha amylase, secreted mainly by the parotid glands. The pH range is 6.6-6.8. The enzyme salivary amylase acts only on the interior alpha-1 underscore 4 glycosidic linkage of amylase and amylopectin of polysaccharides to release the disaccharide maltose and oligosaccharides maltotriose and alpha limit dextrins. However, the food remains in the mouth only a short time, so that probably not more than 5% of all the starches will have become hydrolyzed by the time the food is swallowed. Stomach, however, starch digestion sometimes continues in the body and fund use of the stomach for as long as one hour before the food becomes mixed with the stomach secretions. Then activity of the salivary amylase is blocked by acid of the gastric secretions, because the amylase is essentially non-active as an enzyme once the pH of the medium falls below about 3.0. However, if a starchy meal is thoroughly mixed with amylase during chewing or remains unmixed in the oral stomach for a time, before food and its accompanying saliva do become completely mixed with the gastric secretions, as much as 30 to 40 percent of the starches will have been hydrolyzed mainly to form maltose, small intestine, digestion by pancreatic amylase, amylopsin. Most luminal starch digestion is carried out by the pancreatic enzyme and no problems result if salivary amylase is absent. Pancreatic secretion, like saliva, contains a large quantity of alpha amylase that is almost identical in its function with the alpha amylase of saliva but is several times as powerful. These identical enzymes have a pH optimum near 7.1 are activated by chlorine and produce identical digestion products. Within 15 to 30 minutes after the chyme empties from the stomach into the duodenum and mixes with pancreatic juice, virtually all of the carbohydrates will have become digested. The products of pancreatic amylase digestion of polysaccharides are also maltose, maltotriose, and alpha limit dextrins which contain the alpha 1-6 linkage branch points and alpha 1-4 linkages adjacent to the branch points. These 1-4 linkages are resistant to amylase. Free glucose is never produced by the action of amylase. Digestion by intestinal epithelial enzymes, the enterocytes lining the villi of the small intestine contain four enzymes, lactase, sucrase, maltase, and alpha dextrinase, which are capable of splitting the disaccharides lactose, sucrose, and maltose, plus other small glucose polymers, into their constituent monosaccharides. 
These enzymes are located in the enterocytes covering the intestinal microvilli brush border, so that the disaccharides are digested as they come in contact with these enterocytes. Lactose is split into equimolar molecule of galactose and a molecule of glucose by lactase. Lactase is a beta-galactosidase. Its pH range is 5.4 to 6.0. Sucrose splits into a molecule of fructose and a molecule of glucose by sucrase. Maltase 3 and IV have sucrase activity. Maltose and other small glucose polymers all split into multiple molecules of glucose by maltase. Dextrinase or isomaltase hydrolyzes dextrin, maltose and maltriose to glucose. Thus, the final products of carbohydrate digestion are all monosaccharides. They are all water-soluble and are absorbed immediately into the portal blood. In the ordinary diet which contains far more starches than all other carbohydrates combined, glucose represents more than 80% of the final products of carbohydrate digestion and galactose and fructose each seldom more than 10%. Wow! We've all made it this far in the lecture. Hope you're enjoying it as much as I'm doing. Let's talk about absorption. Absorption of carbohydrates. Carbohydrate digestion produces the monosaccharides glucose, galactose, and fructose. These three hexoses are the only dietary sugars of any consequence that are absorbed. In general, these substrates are too large to pass through the aqueous channels between the enterocytes or through the pores and the apical cell membranes. Thus, only a small fraction of sugar absorption takes place by passive diffusion. The amount passively absorbed is somewhat variable, influenced by bulk flow. The large majority of hexose uptake is by mediated transport. Glucose and galactose are absorbed by an active transport process requiring the presence of sodium ion in the lumen. This sodium-dependent glucose transporter SGLT1, is identical for both sugars, because each competes with the other for transport. SGLT1 has two receptive sites, one for glucose or galactose and the other for sodium ion. But if sodium ion is not at its site, Glucose or galactose cannot be absorbed because in such a deficiency, the absorbing system does not operate. <laughs> the uptake of glucose and galactose depends on the electrochemical sodium ion gradient generated by the sodium potassium PIS in the basolateral membrane and is therefore a secondary active transport system. When both sites have been duly occupied, sodium ion moves under a concentration gradient into the cell pulling along the carrier on which glucose or galactose is attached. Within the cell, the sodium ion concentration is maintained low by the sodium potassium PIS. Thus, inside the cell, the equilibrium is such that sodium ion leaves the carrier. Glucose and galactose within the cell exit across the basolateral membrane and are carried away by the circulation. Therefore, there is also a concentration gradient favoring the removal of the sugars from the carrier. Sugars leave the cell by a sodium ion independent facilitated diffusion process, GLUT2. The GLUT2 is activated by insulin from the pancreas. The exit of sugars from the cell is rapid, and there is little intracellular accumulation. The carrier is then free to combine with more sodium ion and glucose or galactose in the luminal compartment. Because of this mechanism, the addition of glucose or galactose to the lumen will increase sodium absorption. Having good time, huh? Let's dive into fructose absorption. Fructose does not involve an energy requiring step or a cot transporter in the apical membrane. Rather, fructose is transported across both the apical and basolateral membranes by facilitated diffusion. In the apical membrane, the fructose specific transporter is called GLUT5 and in the basolateral membrane, fructose is transported by GLUT2. Much of the fructose, on entering the cell, becomes phosphorylated, then converted to glucose, and finally transported in the form of glucose the rest of the way into the blood but this mechanism is probably not important in humans. Because fructose is not co-transported with sodium, its overall rate of transport is only about one half that of glucose or galactose. The rate of absorption of the monosaccharides is as follows, galactose greater than, glucose greater than, 
fractals greater than manos greater than, xylos greater than, arabinos, in that order. We're almost at the end of the lecture. You did well for sticking around with me. Model of the carriers involved in the absorption of glucose, galactose, and fructose. The sugars absorbed by enterocytes are transported by the portal blood to the liver where they are converted to glycogen or remain in the blood. After a meal, the level of blood glucose rises rapidly, usually peaking at 30 to 60 minutes. The concentration of glucose can be as high as 150 mg per deciliter. Although enterocytes can use glucose for fuel, glutamine is preferred. Both galactose and glucose can be used in the glycosylation of proteins in the Golgi apparatus of the enterocytes. Thank you for joining the class. We do this again.